So I think we can move on to the next session, Anita. Yes, sure. Okay, so um, we have our speaker here ready to go. So the next speaker is um, going to be taking up the topic, leveraging AWS Fargate for running cost-friendly and containerized applications. And this is going to be led by one victory. One victory works remotely as a software engineer for Outlands. It's a certification on AWS and Microsoft technical articles on cloud services and tooling for developer-focused organizations such as Okta, Digital Ocean, and StepZen. Over to you, Wani Victory. I hope I pronounced that right. Yeah, you did. You did. Uh, Mike, check. Can anyone hear me? Yes, we can. All right. So uh, today I'll be talking about... Um, AWS Fargate and how we can leverage it for running cost-friendly containerized applications. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Pretty much excited. Oops, no, 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 no. All right. So first off, um, this talk is pretty much important because minimal operating expenditure is often the goal for every startup, every small project and every solo developer having a minimal operating expenditure is something that they look forward to and they work towards. And just to define that first, um, operating expenditure refers to the money that you pay to run, to use a service while running your application. So on the cloud, if you're using any service, the money you're paying for it is being referred to as your operating expenditure. And um, the reason why we look forward to a minimal operating expenditure is to avoid huge cloud bills. So everybody knows that the cloud is expensive. These services are built heavily for, you pay a lot. And that is why they try to they, um, make sure that you have a minimal operating expenditure because you do not want to get built heavily at the end of the month. And so today, within the next um, few minutes, I'll be speaking on how Fargate helps developers who are interested in running container applications have very minimal operating expenditure. And... Um, <clears throat> slide okay so before i move into what fargate is i'd first of all like to take a step back and talk about containers because fargate is a service for running containers so first off containers are everywhere we all use containers either we use it directly in running our applications or we use it indirectly for those who work with services such as heroku netlify those are platform as a services underneath they use containers also in running the applications. And over the years, containers have proven to be very, very beneficial for software development. It's, it's literally everywhere. We also have tools that are used by millions of developers for running containers. And in comparison to virtual machines, which we use years back for running applications, containers are lightweight. They are cloud native because they fit well into the cloud architecture. And with that, they are very scalable. They are used for running microservices, running very large applications. And they are cheaper to run because unlike um, virtual machines, we can have several containers running within a single virtual machine. They are platform agnostic also. So you can have a single container run across multiple cloud platforms. But there is an issue with containers. And that is containers do not run on thin air. These containers, they run somewhere, either locally on your computer while you're building your application or on the cloud using your either your on-prem service or a full cloud provider like um, AWS, Microsoft, or the Google Cloud platform. And so there's always an infrastructure that is powering up. And this introduces some problems. First off, this infrastructure has to be created. It has to be updated. And when there's an issue, it has to be patched alongside being monitored constantly to know when to roll out an update to your underlying infrastructure that powers your containers. And also, this, this um, infrastructure needs to grow as your application scales. As you scale from thousands to millions of requests, 
the underlying infrastructure for your containers needs to grow also. And this means that you're paying more and you're also having toil. From an SRE standpoint, toil refers to the manual work that you do repeatedly. So as your underlying infrastructure is growing, there are several things that you need to do. Probably if you spin up a new server, you have to install certain tools on them before you can run your containers on them. So these are, are problems that people face before they can use containers. And this is where Fargate comes in. So what exactly is Fargate? Well, Fargate is a computing service on the AWS. And the major purpose that the main purpose for Fargate is that it provides the right compute capacity for your cluster on AWS. Fargate introduces the, the serverless computing model as Fargate manages and takes care of your compute infrastructure. So generally, we know that in the serverless model, you are basically using a third-party service to run your application, but you have no idea of that service. All you do is just put your application there. It runs it, it takes care of it, and you probably pay to use it. And this is the same ideology that Fargate brings in to containers. So AWS is the one that manages the underlying infrastructure for your containers. And just to be clear here, when I say underlying infrastructure, I mean the compute instances. On AWS, compute instances are the EC2 virtual machines that you spin up or that is being spinned up for you if you use some cloud formation to create a... a a, a, a cluster. So Fargate is currently available for the Elastic Container Service and the Elastic Kubernetes Service, the EKS. So one thing to take note of is that Fargate is not a new service. It's been around since 2017 when it was first released. Then two years later in 2019, they released support for the EKS. So first it's rolled out with the ECS, then EKS came along. Then when using Fargate, if you want to know what exactly is going on, you have the integration with CloudWatch, the usage metrics there where you can see what is being used, how long it has been used. And you can also set up alarms to ensure that you do not overspend or you do not exceed certain thresholds and limits. So now back to the question, is Fargate really cost friendly? I've seen a lot of arguments about this online. And what I would say is it depends largely on your use case. It depends on how you plan to use Fargate. Some people have come up to say that, oh, Fargate is expensive. But one thing I would like, I would like everyone to keep in mind when you think about this is that cost does not just, um, cost is not only the amount you pay. Cost also includes the labor and time you spend in running your, your clusters. So, if you are spending a whole lot of time managing these clusters manually, you can also count that as your cost because it's more like a time and labor cost. So in the long run, Fargate pays off because it reduces the time that you spend in managing this infrastructure. Rather than you being the one to manage them, why not just ship it off to AWS to manage it for you while you pay them some money for it? Then also, if you want to reduce your cost, you also have the Fargate spot for fault tolerant applications. Although this spot is only available for the ECS, not EKS. So if you are familiar with AWS, we have spot instances, which allows you to use spare compute instances. They are given to you, but this can be shut down at any time. And that's why there's a catch here. Fargate spot should only be used for fault tolerant applications because it could be shut down within a two minute notice period. Now, estimating runtime costs. The AWS pricing calculator allows us to estimate the cost for running a particular service over a period of time. So I'd like to do a quick demo here on how much it would cost to use a service via the EKS and the EKS alone. Then we proceed to use it with Fargate. First, I would do this with the EKS only. Okay. 
So for, for the EKS, the bill is being generated based on the amount of clusters that you have running. And this is what I spoke about. Hello, can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello, Wani, are you there? Okay. Yeah, yeah, since I, I went off for a bit. Okay, for, so for using the EKS, you're being built based on the clusters that you have running. And you can look at more details on the calculation here. We have the money being generated here, and this is justice. So for it, it's like there's a whole lot of things being abstracted for you, and AWS just gives you a single bill for you to pay. Now let's take a look at um, Fargate. All right. So now you would notice that there are a lot more fields here on Fargate because Fargate gives you the flexibility to pay for for what you request. You can see we have the operating system. The total cost here is being generated based on what we have here. So if I were to increase the amount of the virtual CPUs here, and also the number of tax reports, keep an estimate of five. And you can see the pricing has gone up. And that's just to demonstrate that you're paying exactly what you request for. It's not like when you're using the EKS alone, where the EKS gives you a lot of things. So AWS is just giving you a single bill. But with Fargate, you're paying just what you request for and what you're, being, what you're making use of. So... <clears throat> Back to my slides. So who should use Fargate? Well, the answer is anyone who is bothered about the compute infrastructure for their containers. If you're fine with taking care of your containers yourself, or if you're fine with having to do all those ma manual work, I would say you should keep on using the EKS. But if you feel tired having to manage the line infrastructure for your, your clusters, I will tell you to use Fargate. If you're wondering who has made use of Fargate, there are three success stories on the AWS documentation for Fargate. We have of Samsung, Koala, and Vanguard who migrated their very large workloads into Fargate. But before you move to Fargate, there are several constraints that you should keep in mind, although they are not much. They are re relating to networking mostly. Okay, so the constraints. Um, there are 18 constraints to keep in mind before migrating your workloads into Fargate. But some of these notable constraints are first, daemon sets are not supported for Fargate. So if you are making use of daemon sets, you should think twice before moving to Fargate. Or you can make use of SCARs for your cluster. Then two, each pod has some level of isolation as they run within each virtual machine. So each of the pods in your containers all run in a separate virtual machine, but these virtual machines are managed by AWS, not you. Then privileged containers, and also the pods are available within private subnets. Then the fifth one, which I'll talk more on later, is that the network load balancers, the load balancers that are exposing your application can only make use of IP targets. At the later part of this talk, I will discuss more on this. But for now, I'll just move forward to how does Fargate work with the EKS. So the way you configure Fargate for EKS is through a profile. A profile is a configuration that has several fields that um, configure how Fargate works. Within a single cluster, you can have, have several profiles across different environments or namespaces. For example, you could have a profile for the dev production environments and each profile consists of a namespace a selector and some optional labels now this is great because 
you can have pods within several um, profiles. The, the, concept of, the concept of bringing in profiles is for you to be able to organize the pods within your cluster. So if you're in like a development pod, you can, sorry, if you're having a development um, profile, you can have certain pods within that profile. If you have that for staging, you can have the pods within that also. So having several profiles allows you to organize the pods within your cluster. And there's, there are maximum of five selectors within each profile. So the, the use of these selectors are to organize the profiles. Just, um, sorry, the use of each selectors are to organize the pods, just like I've said. So when you create a new pod, there's a selector attached to it. If you want the pod to be within dev, you add the selector for that. So there's like a system where you can organize these things by yourself. Then the scheduling of the cluster pods into Fargate is made through the use of Kubernetes controllers. For those that are familiar with Kubernetes, you know that controllers watch the state of the cluster. So as you create a new um, pod within that cluster, it checks if the, if the selectors match between the profile and the pod you're creating. If it's match, it pushes it into that profile that you've created all within Fargate. So I have a, a mini demo here. I couldn't do a full demo because it takes a lot of time to create a cluster, as we all know. So using uh, Fargate with the Elastic Kubernetes service is made possible through the EKS C2 tool. This tool is used generally for managing everything that relates to the EKS, and it also has support for Fargate. Welcome back, Victory. Um, can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Welcome back. Yeah, apologies. I had a rainfall earlier on. All right, so I stopped with using the using Fargate for the EKS, and the EKS CTL tool is what we use to create the Fargate profile, which runs the pods. So below here is an example image of the Fargate command being used to create the Fargate profile. And one of the things that I love about Fargate is how flexible it is. So you can decide to create the profile at the same time that you create the cluster, or you can decide to do this before creating the cluster. Oh, sorry. You can decide to create the profile at the point where you create the cluster, or you can create the cluster first, then create the profiles later on. But something to note that is that you must um, use the, the, the Fargate flag when creating the cluster because by default, not all EKS clusters have support for Fargate. So at the point where you create a cluster on the EKS, you must specify the Fargate flag so it can create that cluster as a Fargate supported cluster. So the first step to using Fargate is to have a Docker image because the image is your workload, the application that or service you want to run on Fargate. So this is like a pre preliminary step before creating the Fargate cluster, having a Docker image, then pushing it to the ECR, which is the Elastic Container Registry. When you create your workload, you specify the URL to the ECR um, repository in the, the deployment service. So if you are new to this, there are several um, help commands within the AWS console that would show you how to do this. Um, an example of it is shown here within this image. So, so actually using Fargate, the first step is to create the EKS cluster. And like I said earlier on, you have to specify the Fargate flag. Otherwise, it would be created as a normal cluster without the Fargate support. So you execute the EKS CTL, create command, then you specify the Fargate flag attached to that command. Um, underneath, EKS CTL uses CloudFormation with some templates to create the cluster. And it takes a lot of time. I have to mention that if you want to create a cluster, you probably want to do something else on the side because it would take about 20 to 30 minutes roughly before the cluster is fully created. So if I were to do this within this talk, it would take the entire time. 
let's assume 30 minutes have passed. We now have a cluster ready. You can view the components of your cluster in the cloud formation um, page of the AWS console. You, you would see the EKSCTL attached to the name of the cluster that you created. Here, a random name was generated because I did not specify the name. If I had specified that name, you would have seen it here. But yeah, a beautiful unicorn is random name it was generated for the cluster. Now, the next is to create the profile. So the image on the left side here shows the field for a profile. The profile is created as a cluster config type. Then we have the metadata, which consists of the name, which is here I use Fargate Fastify Cluster. And basically within this demo, we would be imagining that I'm trying to push a Fastify application to the EKS. So Fastify is a no -ES, um framework for creating servers, uh, for creating backend applications, pretty much similar to ExpressJS, if that sounds familiar. So within this section here, within the Fargate profile field, I have two profiles being specified. First is the Fastify default profile with a namespace selector. Then the second one is a Fastify prod profile. So like I said earlier on within this talk, in a single cluster, you can have several profiles for several environments that you have within your application. Here I have the default um, environments, which is dev, and I have the second one, which is prod. Then the next is to create a deployment resource. On the image, the snippets here on the right is a sample depo deployment resource field. First, we have the name, the namespace, the labels, then the selectors. This would contain two pods. Then down below, I also have the image repo URI. So if you're doing this yourself, you'd have to change that placeholder to the URI of your, your image within the ECR. Then this is the next interesting part of this talk, which is exposing the application to the internet. So workloads within Fargate's supported clusters are exposed through the use of a load balancer. And this is where one of the constraints of Fargate's come in, which is the fifth that I mentioned earlier on. And that is you can only use IP targets with network load balancers and application load balancers. And this is so because you do not have control over the instances. Remember we said Fargate is used when you want AWS to manage the instances for you. So you cannot use instance targets for Fargate because those clusters, those um, instances are not being managed by you. They're being managed by AWS. And to do this, you need to have the AWS load balancer controller installed. And that will be done using Helm. The documentation page contains several steps to have that installed. They are quite lengthy, so I could not put them here. But the installation guide is very thorough. It will guide you through the process of installing the load balancer controller into your cluster. Uh, the, after doing that, when you're sure you have the load balancer controller installed, you can now proceed to create the load balancer. This is very similar to the load balancers that you might have created in the past if you use um, EKS a lot. But there's a major difference here. And that is, it has some annotations which specify the IP target type. So you can see three um, annotations there. Then after that, we have the selector, which matches with the previous ones. Then the ports that you want to expose, which is port 5050. That's where the Fastify application would be running. And that's the, the last step. After this, when you apply all these configurations, you would have a Fargate cluster that runs and that generates very minimal bill for you because you're only using what you request for. Unlike the regular clusters that would probably have two instances we need, this would probably have just one for idle. Then as your application grows, as you create more pods, those instances would be created automatically by AWS. Then when your, your demand reduces, they would also be scaled down for you to ensure that your cost remains minimal and did not exceed the limits. 
So for that resources on Fargate, we have the Fargate documentation. Then there's a guide written by one of the AWS solutions architects on Kubernetes to the cloud. Then uh, we also have a guide that talks about the comparison between the EKS and the regular, um, between EKS supported with Fargate and regular EKS, which you can go through in your spare time. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, I don't know if there's any question from anyone. Hello, can anyone hear me? Yes, I can hear you. That was an awesome presentation. I agree. Uh, let's work. I actually messed up my presentation. It's I don't fine. Know. <laughs> I think we had a similar issue too yesterday. Yeah, and we were okay. like, if you're I'll this morning. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, no worries. It happens. Yeah. So, any question, anyone? Um, if you have questions later or you are watching this later uh, on YouTube and you want to ask uh, Victor questions, you can reach out to him on Twitter at uh, I, I am Umwani. Uh, on Twitter. Um, Let me also display the name so it shows. Yeah. Okay. Is this zero one that we that is added or which one is incorrect? Let me fix it. Uh, there's a zero one at the end of it. Oh, okay. 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 So so if you have questions later, we are watching this on YouTube later and you have questions, you can uh reach out to him on Twitter. Awesome presentation by the way, Victory. Uh, thanks. Yeah.